Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of VSIG. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. This is being done by providing a coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support to power system operators across the five action pillars. The foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the globe who are among those facing higher penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than most other operators in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, workforce development, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. More information on the GPST can be found at globalpst.org. BSIG serves as the lead of Pillar 1, and as such, would like to welcome you to our monthly joint GPST Pillar 1 eSIG webinar series. This series is in addition to the regular eSIG monthly webinar series and focuses on the research agenda and research questions being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are being presented by both the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, such as 50 Hertz today, and members of industry and academia participating in the activities of the Research Agenda Group, or the RAG, and the Research Advisory Committee, or the RAC, Pillar 1. An additional series of webinars on the other four pillars of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through NREL. For those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to globalpst.org and click on the Get Involved tab. Further information on eSIG can be found at eSIG.energy. Next, I would like to go over a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we're going to be using the Slido platform at slido.com. We'll not be using WebEx for questions. You need to open a browser window, go to slido.com, and enter eSIG14 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of this screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions on Slido to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save 10 or 15 minutes for the Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar. So please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar consists of a talk on STATCOM strategy and application in the east of Germany. Based on the number of registrations, this is shaping up to be another very popular webinar. The interest around the world today in the application of inverter-based resources of all types is intense, and particularly in grid-forming inverters. Today's webinar will feature three engineering experts from the transmission department of the German TSO 50 Hertz, who will speak with us about grid-forming applications and statcoms in Germany. The three speakers will include Dr. Florian Sass, the electrical engineer for operational concepts, who is the expert for HVDC, facts, and voltage control processes. Next is Cornelius Heck, team leader for stability analysis and large projects in strategic grid planning. He mainly focuses on the system planning of HVDC and offshore connections and assesses the influence of increasing injection from inverter-based resources. The third speaker is Roman Heinz, the asset manager for HVDC and FACTS, who is responsible for the current STATCOM tender package, including the specification. I feel very fortunate to have Florian, Cornelius, and Roman here with us today and really appreciate their willingness and ability to share their knowledge and experience with us, and I look forward to working with them. The webinar today will focus on the challenges imposed upon the Eastern German transmission system with the replacement of synchronous machines by inverter-based resources, which is fundamentally changing the dynamic and stability properties of the grid. They will also present the current strategy to overcome these challenges, with special regard to voltage regulation and inertia considerations related to grid-forming statcoms. 
The webinar will take us on a journey from current system operation experience through st strategic grid planning identification of needs, and finally to asset specification, where the rubber meets the road. Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of ESIG14 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Florian, I will now turn it over to you. So thank you, Charlie, for this really nice, kind introduction. So Cornelius, my colleague, is sharing the slides. Um, so everyone should be ready to see it and be able to see it. So let's start. Um, so next slide, please, Cornelius. And I think we also had this introduction round uh, done by Charlie, so we can directly start with the with the topic and the content. So before um, my colleagues um, Roman and uh, Cornelius will start with a deep dive into technical details and also um, yeah, technical thoughts, I want to start with a short overview uh, who we are and who 50 Hertz is, um, and also provide you some some additional numbers. So the TSO 50 Hertz is one of the four TSOs in the German system, which is part of the Central European Energy System. Um, we are responsible for more than um, around about 80 million people living in northern and eastern Germany. So um, you see um, on the right corner of Germany, like eastern and northern part of Germany, which is covered uh, by us as 50 hertz, plus the, uh, the metropole area of Hamburg. Um, so we're operating the electrical system, um, meaning the extra high voltage grid, 380 kV and 220 kV, plus several offshore, um, offshore uh, wind farms which are also connected to our system. And in addition, we are um, operating some interconnections also to the Scandinavian countries. So next slide, please. Um, on this slide, um, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, grid map. Um, I will uh, get to some details later on. Uh, but first of all, I want to, uh, to show you where we started in 2010 and where we are right now in 2020. So um, regarding the um, share and power consumption of uh, renewable energy sources, we have a growth of 25 uh, from 25% to 62%. So meaning 62% of, um, of the power consumption is produced by renewable energies in our um, grid area. To, um, to uh, provide this energy, the installed capacity rose from 38 kV um, back in 2010 to 57 uh, gigawatts. They are of wind with 20 gigawatts and 13 gigawatts of photovoltaics. So as you can see, wind almost doubled and uh, most of the wind shed and also most of the installed capacity regarding wind is also in the northern part of our, um, of our control area plus the coast. So the power consumption is more or less uh, stable. So this means that uh, the, of course, because we're producing more power right now, the um, exports from our um, control area to the neighboring countries and also to the other parts of Germany have been increased during the recent years. So um, uh, regarding this, um, like in increasing, um, increasing actions and this increasing work, our turnover more than doubled in the last 10 years and also the staff more than doubled. So we can go to the next slide, um, which brings me to our strategy, our new strategy. It's called from 16 to 100 until 2032. So this means from the uh, renewable energy share of 60% in the year 2020, we want to go up to more uh, around about 100% of renewable share in energy consumption until the year 2032. So to reach this goal, we um, estimate an, um, that the installed capacity within the system will rise regarding wind to 30 gigawatts and also in photovoltaics of, um, to 18 gigawatts. The power consumption is still assumed to be more or less uh, stable. Um, and this means, of course, again, increasing exports from our um, control area to the neighboring control areas. 
So next slide, please. So because this slide is going to show us some more details on the growth we had regarding renewable energy capacity, uh, which is um, yeah, um, which is pictured here between the year 2000, uh, 2000 and 2030. Um, so during these 30 years, you can see the growth. Uh, we started with some onshore wind, and uh, then there was more or less like the the kickstart of the uh, yeah of the trans transformation of the of the German and also of the European energy system between 2010 and 2020. So we more than doubled the installed capacity regarding renewable energy shares, uh, with a constant growth of especially wind, also offshore wind, and of course photovoltaics. So, and right now in the year 2020, as I already said, uh, we have a some um, renewable energy capacity of um, more than uh, 36 uh, gigawatts in our control area. And the growth is continuing. So, next slide, please, Cornelius. So, um, yeah, besides these uh, facts and hard numbers, there are some more facts which are like good to know or interesting to know to better understand our, our, our current situation. So, uh, of course, the high share of renewable energies um, um, and their sources, which are especially placed in the northern part of our control area, it uh, results in volatile power flows and in high transits throughout our region from north to south. So especially in the southern part of our region, you can see there uh, most of the interconnection lines to our um, to the neighboring German TSOs, which is Tenet, and also the um, Czech Republic, um, our um, company Chaps, and also the, the Polish TSO PSE. And yeah, especially in the southern part, we are facing high transits in case of high uh, renewable energy production. But on the other hand, uh, if, if there's no wind and almost no renewable energy consumption, we have um, really low transits. Um, so this means we have some lines running empty. Um, and um, yeah, we have to sometimes struggle with uh, high voltages. So uh, during the last years, we, uh, we faced massive grid expansions in order to, um, to increase the transmission capacity to uh, export the uh, renewable energy production. And most of our lines, especially 80% of all our lines are double line circuits. So all these, um, these, um, these lines, which are, um, which are presented in the, in, the, in the grid map on the left-hand side, they are double lines connecting the individual substations. Um, in addition to this, increasing transits in addition to this um, grid expansion we are facing a severe loss of reactive power sources due to the coal phase out so this means um, especially in the eastern part of um, of, of region that we call Lausitz which is uh, which has been like a, like a coal fired or even lightnight fired uh, region for almost 100 years um, there's um, um, yeah like like the phase out of coal we are losing uh, production capacity um, regarding active power, but also re regarding reactive power. So um, the sources of reactive power production um, are somehow lost and only um, yeah, provided in parts by the renewable energies since they're placed in the northern part and not in the high transit area of the south. So in fact, we are facing increasing costs for voltage related redispatch. So this means, um, also in like in, in um, like in high transit scenarios where we have a lot of um, production during renewable energies with low energy prices, we have to run some uh, coal coal fired power plants from time to time in order to try to provide enough reactive power to um, to cover the consumption of the lines. And same thing during uh, low transit scenarios, we also are fa um, facing some voltage um, or reactive power provision problems. And we also have to um, run some cold power plants in order to um, balance the reactive power demand of our system. Okay, so next slide, please, uh, which leads us to some deeper insights on like, um, um, yeah, um, historical events that we are facing in um, in system operation or that we face in system operation, but they are yeah, more or less representative to what we're facing right now and also what we are estimating during the next years. So as I described already, 
we're facing this volatile generation. Um, as you can see on the on the right hand side on the on the first bar. So this is um, um, yeah some some historical data measured between the uh, between 10 uh, p.m. and 1 a.m. Um, and you, this is uh, the, um, yeah, the, the voltage measured at one of our substations in such an high transit, um, transit area. Um, and as you can see, we have some severe voltage dips and uh, voltage, uh, voltage jumps of uh, about four to six um, kV. So this means the system is right now highly sensitive towards um, active power changes and reactive power changes. So we are really facing a, um, increased sensitivity increased water sensitivity, which is a thing. And um, on the on the figure below is um, the same substation. It's um, uh, one time the me measurement was done um, in winter time and one time the measurement was done in, in summertime. And you can see that the voltage profile we are seeing is highly differing. So this means uh, with the voltages of between like 405 and 400 kV, this is a high transit scenario. So the voltage is at a like a like a modest modest level. Um, but uh, during low transit scenarios, the voltage is rising and the voltage is way higher, and we are not able to control the voltage anymore. So it's still like in 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 in, in the um, in a secure in a secure state, of course, the system. But you can see it's the same, it's the same substation, and there's a voltage difference of around about um, 10 to 15 um, kV, just regarding and depending on the scenario we're facing. So uh, to manage this um, new challenges in, in um, system operations, we need to decrease. Um, um, uh, we need to face the decreasing reactive power reserves regarding static voltage control, and we also have to tackle the problem of increasing voltage sensitivity of the system by means of dynamic voltage control. So to sum it up, in, in system operation, we have a high need and an increasing need for flexible, automated, uh, and dynamic impact on the voltage control. So next slide, please. This is going to be the last um, insight on system operations. And this um, yeah, somehow describes the journey where we're coming from and where we're heading to. So there are um, several information um, um, combined in this figure. So you can see the timeline uh, starting with 2010 going up until 2030. And on the, um, the y-axis, you see the transmission capacity. Back in the year 2010, um, our trans transformers and lines were facing the re required uh, transport capacity and the uh, transport demand, which is uh, indicated by by blue. The transport demand and the transport capacity is indicated by the dotted line. And you also can see that our reactive power potential was higher than needed, so there was no limiting factor. Then starting the um, the um, the energy vendor, so the transformation of the of the energy system, the transport demand was increasing step by step between 2010, 2015, 2020. Um, so we see the transport demand was increasing, and out of a sudden, our transport capacity regarding transformers and lines, so meaning thermal capacity, was not high enough anymore. So there was um, there was a gap, there was a congestion, there was a bottleneck based on thermal transfer capacity. But then we started a lot of grid extensions. We also came up with ideas like higher utilization of the system, curative actions, for example, high temperature lines. So we were increasing step by step the thermal trans transfer capacity, which brings us to the year 2025 and even 2030. So you can see the transformers and lines, they're really close to the transport demand. They're not the limiting factor anymore. But the coal phase out hit us. Reactive power potentials are decreasing. And suddenly, the reactive power provision is the limiting factor regarding transport capacity, meaning we can't uh, provide the, um, the, um, consumed, the consumed reactive power of the, of the system anymore. And, um, uh, yeah, due to this fact, we have to decrease um, renewable energy 
um, production in a way, and we also have to decrease transport capacity. And in order to uh, to meet our transport demand and to close this gap between um, demand and capacity, we have to come up with new reactive power um, resources. And um, yeah, with this last slide, I'm handing over to Cornelius, and uh, yeah, he will uh, start to describe how we attend to um, to close this gap. So thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the presentation. So I hope you are able to hear me now and hopefully the videos will start in a second as well. So thank you very much Florian for setting the stage. If you cannot hear me, please let me know now, otherwise I'm going to just start. So apparently we have a lack in reactive power and possibly some other um, system services. The key question um, that we would face over the next 10 to 20 years in our uh, control area would be the voltage stability, the frequency stability, which we haven't heard so much of so far, but it will be a difficult topic to handle over the next 20 years. And starting uh, off the middle of this century, we will also face huge challenges coming from power electronics. To get a better understanding of the following slides, I just want to run you through our philosophy. So here you can see where the system um, services, so for example, reactive power, dynamic um, uh, reactive current injection, frequency st uh, stabilization and so on can come from. So far, conventional power plants have been used to provide most of these system services. And in the future, renewable energies and also consumers will provide the majority of the contribution. But to fill the gap that is um, occurring, especially until the years of 2030 and 2035, we need some specialized assets. And today we are going to focus on these specialized assets. And over the next few slides, I'm going to talk you through how much compensation of specialized assets we need, what kind of compensation we need, and what I'm not going to talk about in this. Um, this presentation is if there are other ways and how did we figure out how many and how, how big the contribution from RES and consumers could be. So first, let me start off with the reactive power. And Florian has already shown you uh, that we have problems with too high voltages, but also with too low voltages and also with weird voltage dips, even if no uh, faults in our system occurred. And to tackle this challenge in a planning horizon for the year 2035, we um, used this approach. We're just calculating a load flow and we calculated how much um, reactive power our loads will need, how much reactive power in each um, operation scenario our grid will need, so how much Q is lost in our transformers in our lines. And then we will subtract the Q potential coming from our generation units and the compensation assets that we have already in place. And we sum up this term and we do that for the grid areas that you can see on the left side. So basically for the area of 50 Hertz, these are just the federal states and we sum up all uh, the different Q consumptions and injections for each area. As you can see, we do this for um, mechanically switched reactors, so for situations where we're facing high voltages, but we're also doing this for MSCDN and also for dynamic. And obviously the approach, that, the approach that I've shown doesn't work for the dynamic here. So what we do here is we subtract the N minus zero case from the N minus one case, and we have a difference in reactive power balance that we need to fill with dynamic um, reactive power injection. And for the year 2035, for the control area of 50 Hertz, this will lead to a deficit of seven gigawatt of shunt reactors, seven gigawatt of MSCDN, and even nine gigawatt for reactive dynamic, uh, dynamic reactive power. But this was just to tackle the question how much uh, reactive power is needed. 
we haven't uh, tackled the question now uh, how this uh, reactive power should be comprised of. So this is um, done on the next slide. And what we did here is we just had our grid for the year 2035 uh, and we put all the reactive uh, compensation that we had in, uh, in this operation scenario and put it all as static Q compensation. So in here, it's all MSCDN and um, well, a few power plants that are still left, but that's not the majority here. And as you can see, already within the first one and a half seconds after a short circuit has occurred, we will run into a voltage collapse. So there's no stable operation possible here, but could be stable if you just converted parts of this static uh, compensation to dynamic compensation, which we did here. And here we just took the number that we um, calculated earlier, so the nine gigawatt of Statcom for our control area. And as you can see, now we have some really smooth voltage recovery and even uh, already after about three to four seconds, we'll have perfect uh, conditions once again. So for now, we have answered the question that we need to implement fast dynamic reactive power in order to stabilize our grid. I've already stated that the reactive power problem is not the only problem that we are, um, we are facing. We might also face some frequency stability problems, but what are these problems going to look like? So first things first, um, the typical outage of one huge power plant, so for the Central European grid, that would be three gigawatts, that is um, the reference case, will not be a problem for rock-off situations in the future. So rock-off, that is rate of change of frequency. So the gradient of the frequency just after an event has occurred. But maybe there are other problems that might cause problems. And one of these problems is the system split. And on the right side, you see a map of Europe and indicated by the colors here, you can see the system split that took place in the year 2006, where we had a blue area, green island and a red island. And just to give you an idea, Florian has already told you that mainly in our grid, there's a huge excess of uh, generation. And looking at the year 2035, we're looking at a an unbalance of up to 40 gigawatt between the green and the blue uh, island. So what, do we see any problems coming from this? Well, it wouldn't be pr any problem if we had enough uh, inertia still in our grid that could counteract this imbalance and act as a frequency stabilizer. But looking at the kinetic energy that is stored in our generation units over the next 15 years, just in our control area, we see a huge decline in kinetic energy. So the minimum of 2021 is even higher than the median for 2035. And especially the last part of the coal phase out will hit us severely in our control area. But still, this shouldn't be a problem, you might say. So let's have a look at the rock off, how they would um, appear. So far, we know that one hertz per second rock off would be fine and should be survived. Two hertz per second could be critical, but could also be survived. And everything above or below the two hertz per second limit um, will most likely lead to a large blackout of um, greater parts of Europe. And what you can see here is the rock off on the y axis and the hours of the year on the x axis. And you can see the lines for the different scenarios here. So 2021 up to 2035. And as you can see, already in 2021, um, for almost half of the year, we will be above the limit of one hertz per second. And looking at 15 years into the future, this threshold will be um, violated in almost three quarters of the year. And even uh, the two hertz per second limit will be violated um, even four times often as today. So the system split really does pose a, a dangerous threat. And in order to counteract this, 
we would need to implement a lot of inertia in our grid. So for the 50 hertz area, we would look at 100 gigawatt seconds that we would need. Or, obviously, this is also a, a second option that there would be. We could just do massive amounts of redispatch in order to just use the uh, imbalance between the green and the blue island. But this, of course, will lead to massive costs up in, uh, in a few billions for each year. I promise you a third uh, issue that we are going to uh, face in the next years. And this is the issue coming from power electronic interface generation. So especially from so-called grid following generation. And I'm pretty sure most of you have heard uh, the, the terms grid following and grid forming already, but what really is the difference? So grid forming uh, generation would be thought of as a voltage source behind an um, impedance, which then has an inherent reaction to all sorts of changes in the grid. So if there was a voltage angle jump, it would inherently react in the correct way. If there was a voltage uh, amplitude jump, it would um, inherently cor uh, react correctly and so on. And you can see here, this uh, is um, the, the example for um, a voltage angle jump and the grid forming device will inject um, active power in order to counteract this voltage jump, whereas the grid following device will mainly do nothing. Of course, after the first few hundred milliseconds, grid forming and grid following is hard to distinguish between. And this is because in this area, overlaying characteristics um, come into play. So here is the frequency sensitivity mode or really fast frequency control, if you want to call it this way. So we had a project in Germany to determine what's uh, a critical point of um, grid following generation in an otherwise synchronous generated uh, dominated uh, grid. And this is really, really easy to understand, I guess. So what we see on, uh, on here is how much of power electronic interface generation do we have? So as as share of the total generation in, the, in any remaining island. So for example, the green island that we've seen a few slides ago, and then how big of a power exchange could, could it be? So 10% or 50% of the total generation. And as long as we stay below a threshold of up to 40% of um, grid following devices that make up the total generation of one island, um, a power exchange of up to 50% seems feasible. At least in our, in our studies, it, would, it was feasible. But looking at uh, power exchanges also beginning at 10% already, but with shares of 80% of um, grid following generation, it is not stable anymore. So we will face blackouts here. And don't need to talk about 100% because 80% was already unstable. But how would this picture look like if we had uh, only grid forming devices? Ta-da, it's all green. So apparently we can uh, operate a system without any conventional power plants um, if we just had enough grid forming devices. Yes, there is um, a kind of optimum in between. We don't need to have everything as grid forming. Some might still be okay to be grid following. And we will always have some uh, synchronous machines in the grid coming from pumped storage units from underlying um, combined heat and gas, um, combined heat and uh, uh, electricity power plants and so on. But it really shows that we need to start rolling out grid forming uh, control as fast as possible to not come into um, this problem where we have the two frowny faces already at a 40% share of renewable energy generation. So, concluding the last uh, 10 minutes, what do we know now? So we know export and transit through our area, control area is rising and therefore also the demand of reactive power and inertia. At the same time, nuclear and coal will phase out in Germany leading to a lack of reactive power potential and inertia. So there is 
going to be a large amount of compensation that needs to be uh, implemented in our control area. And this will be uh, combined with a lot higher cross-border trades between European countries and thus giving uh, the transport distance also an increase. And this will lead to much higher load flow fluctuations. And if you remember the uh, slide that Florian has showed uh, already today, you see it during load flow changes, changes um, voltage changes of up to five to six kilovolt. And this will increase dramatically over the future. And due to the increase of transport distance, the impact of short circuits will also increase. At the same time, we are looking at an increase of uh, the penetration of power electronic interface generation and a reduction of synchronous generation. And that's uh, why we need um, compensation that's dynamic, fast, grid forming with virtual inertia. So to conclude here, Specialized assets are imperative to secure stable system operation. And what is our plan to fulfill this goal? If you remember the 2032 goal, up to 100% uh, renewable energy share of our consumption, um, we try to, uh, to fill the gap of system uh, services with three stages of STATCOMs. And the three stages are indicated on the map right here. So the first stage is the green uh, bubbles, the next the red, and then we have the orange bubbles as the last stage up until 2032. And the size of the bubble obviously uh, tells you how big the statcoms are going to be. But we are looking at a standardization of 300 megawatt statcom, where Roman is going to tell you a little bit more about. And some of these statcoms will have an extended swing range. Swing range. So for example, in this location, we are looking at a statcom with additional MSCDN to have some more reactive power capability for under voltage situations. For all the statcom that we are talking about here, um, we want them to be grid forming already, grid forming control. So to, uh, to increase the share of grid forming um, uh, devices in our grid. And looking at the stages two and three, we are talking about statcom with a short short-term storage to provide artificial inertia to counteract these uh, huge rock-offs that we've seen a few slides ago. So to conclude everything so far, the STATCOM has been identified as the optimal asset to satisfy all the known needs that we've seen uh, so far. And for the next slides, I'm going to give over to my colleague um, Roman, who will talk you through the asset management parts of our STATCOM project. Thank you very much, Cornelius. Okay, can you then please go to the next slide? So, as my colleagues already um, explained, um, we are facing several problems in 50 hertz, um, especially for, let's say, voltage angle jumps, also for steady state voltage changes, also for, and also for dynamic voltage changes. Uh, fortunately, we have um, yeah, the solution will be the Statcom, and fortunately, we have some experience already with the Statcoms. For example, in Germany, we have installed with Siemens together the first hybrid Statcom, um, which is uh, located in the north of uh, Germany, and this is let's say more or less an offshore Statcom, because when there is in, the, in our offshore grid, um, a fault right through um, um, contingency. Um, this statcom will react um, immediately and will, in, uh, will um, include uh, reactive, uh, inductive reactive power immediately together with a thyristor switch to reactor. And yes, you can maybe also go a little bit further, Cornelius, because you have made a, um, have a, a picture of this of this statcom. Here you see um, the building, also the, um, the outer coolers and the TSR. So this will be the switch director, and in the, here also then the building with a whale for the cooling, so that you have an impression how those kind of statcoms look like and um, um, how big they are. As you see it here, this is a 100 amber statcom. What we are looking for in the future is a 300 amber statcom, which for sure will be um, larger than this installed one. So, uh, as for us, for the asset management, it was a little bit tricky in this, yeah, let's say, short term 
to um, specify uh, those kind of new stat comps and also you have seen that we want to install several of them. So can you please go to the next slide? Okay. Um, our plan is for the first stage, as Cornelia said, to um, to tender for uh, in total eight stat comps together um, operated with MSCDN or maybe with an MSR, MSR mechanical switch reactor and MSCDN mechanical switch uh, capacitance with dynamic network. And here for us right now, we had to face a little bit more, let's say um, the real world, because when we went to the manufacturers two years ago and we asked for this kind of grid forming behavior, and let's say the manufacturers for them, they were a little bit surprised about this um, demand. Maybe they heard about it, but for Statcom, it was quite new for them. Those, this was the reason why we, in this current tender for the eight current uh, for the eight Statcoms, which we're tendering right now, um, the grid forming behavior is more like optional. This is, uh, but maybe, but for example, if somebody has this kind of behavior, they will be, let's say, they will get better evaluation points for that. But anyhow, we have to be realistic. This good for me behavior right now is maybe not applicable, but in the future it will be because we spoke with the manufacturers and so far as we know, uh, all of the, uh, most of the manufacturers have put a lot of budget into the R&D departments and they're developing this good for me behavior with regards to control and also with uh, regards to this um, yeah, an, uh, additional energy storage system. But so far we tendering today and um, we already started this in the beginning of this this year. We start to tender for this eight statcoms. So it will be a normal multi-level statcom with 300 MVA up to two branches. And I mean with two branches, so it could be, for example, two converters. So not every manufacturer can supply, for example, one 300 MVA statcom or converter statcom with one converter. So we also give the option to, um, let's say, to install two 150 MVR statcoms and converters and put them in parallel. So there are several options. But this is also an effect, because, for example, when we wanted to specify maybe on the secondary side of the transformer, let's say um, a standard um, standard voltage, due to the fact that there are several options, we cannot really specify those kind of things like um, sec on the secondary side, those kind of standard voltages, because this will also uh, will depend every time on the installed reactive power you have on the secondary side. Um, but anyhow, we are we are TSO, and our goal is to standard standardize as much as possible. And in the next slides, we will, for example, show you what what we. Um, no, no, can you can go back? No, no, go back, please. Thanks. And um, but for example, um, we will show you what we are, what we want to standardize. But we are also aware that every manufacturer has their own, let's say, specific design, and we have to consider this. By the way. But what we know is that, for example, the standard statcom topology of a statcom is, for example, a delta topology. So it's like um, it's not like a B6 picture, or it's not like a stark topology. Usually, we use delta topologies, and there are, for example, some uh, advantages. For example, for um, neg negative sequence control, these are one of the reasons, and also some others. And what we also expect. For example, when we tender this kind of statcom right now, we expect, them, for example, a voltage secondary side. Um, on the secondary side, uh, something between 30 and 100 kV. So this means when we tender this, and also when you want to specify this, we cannot um, specify standard components. This is, was for us a little bit an issue, um, but anyhow, I think this is. I, I think we can handle this because uh, we can give the manufacturers some freedom in this in this area. But anyhow, um, in addition to the normal, let's say, uh, voltage control for the statcoms. We had some um, additional control demands, and maybe not everyone knows it. How you can also use a statcom, for example, you can add on a statcom besides the normal voltage control active filtering. So it means that you can select several harmonics in the, in the grid voltage harmonics, and um, the statcom will in, inject an uh, harmonic current to reduce the uh, yeah, to do, to reduce the harmonic harmonic voltage. And those kind of things we have um, fortunately already implemented in our current statcom, which I told you before in Lubmin. We did our FAT for this and um, it works quite well. And um, we are also looking forward to implement this in these kind of new statcoms. 
The same is for negative sequence control. So if there's um, a contingency, for example, a, a phase to ground fault in the grid or a two-phase um, two fault, this DATCOM will inject in the grid an asymmetrical current. So it will, yeah, a negative sequence current. And for example, in our first DATCOM, this was not implemented. So when there was, for example, one um, a phase to ground fault, the DATCOM injected um, a symmetrical current in the grid, which was, let's say, for us, not, let's say, the uh, op uh, optimal condition. But as we know it so far with our experiences from our current DATCOMs, um, those kind of control schemes are already in place. And let's say, it's also uh, these are what these are a few steps in um, in the direction of to have a kind of grid forming control because grid forming control can mean several and um, has for example several packages which grid forming control has to fulfill and for example negative sequence control active filterings are one of them and also for example power oscillation damping and so on and as I have told you yes for a um, really important thing is that we can operate and um, we also tender them right now, um, mechanical switched rare impedances like capacitors or reactants in, in the same substation. So it means that the STATCOM will trigger the mechanical switched capacitance or reactor um, by the, um, via, the, via the circuit breaker if the demand of reactive power is needed. And this is usually done by a, um, yeah, a reactive power and uh, voltage linear function. It's also it's usually quite easy. You can select a slope or like um, a droop, and then, for example, this that can will react with the um, yeah, with the corresponding with the, with the correct reactive power depending on the um, yeah, set point you set with with your voltage. And this is, for example, what we for example tender right now. And also, what is also important for us is a black start support function for sure, not like an HVDC. We will, cannot do a black start with a STATCOM. So when the grid, for example, is completely shut down, it is impossible to start this with a STATCOM. But at least you can, a STATCOM can support you during this kind of black start. So it means when, for example, a power plant or an HVDC is restarting your grid during a black start, and the voltage comes back to the certain yeah, to the to the um, to your substation where the where your STATCOM is installed. Uh, we want to use those kind of statcoms to stabilize the voltage during this kind of weak grid situation. So it means that also we um, tender those kind of statcoms, um, let's say, a weak grid control. So it, for example, that the gain is reduced and so on. These are uh, really important, really important topics for us. So yeah, you can also go to the next slide then. As I told you, we um, try to align um, the different manufacturer designs. So we had um, several meetings with, with the manufacturers uh, who, are pretty, who, are, who are, let's say, um, are supplying these kind of these kind of converters. And uh, our goal as a TSO, for sure, as I told you before, we want to standardize it as much as possible. And usually in our substations, we have also not so much um, yeah, space to install those kind of statcoms because they are usually situated um, near to to cities and also to other to other um, yeah, places in Germany where you have not the possibility to buy new land to add those kind of scats that comes to your substations. So we have, let's say, usually only 60, multiplied by 60 meters um, as one footprint, or the other opportunity, um, 42 meters multiplied by two, um, 75 meters. These are our usual footprints we plan right now for our statcoms. And for us, it was a goal to have at least a statcom when we tender it, that the statcom, the statcom said at least uh, that they have more or less the same topology, um, um, a topology, for example, when you go into the, the, the control building. For us, the goal was that uh, when you, for example, order at one supply, that you not get a converter building, which is um, which is different to, for example, to the next um, to the next supplier. And this was for us really important. So this is the reason why we yeah, created um, several civil designs for our for our buildings, and we also check with the manufacturer that they can fit with their design. And so in our current tender, we are forcing, for example, the, ten, uh, the manufacturers to apply to our, let's say, uh, building design. And that's the reason why we also made um, yeah, a specific civil specification. Also, we um, prepared already um, building drawings, um, 3D models, 
kind of, for example, this kind of layout. And um, Cornelius, can you show it? For, can you go? Yes. Okay. You see it here. Because I have, um, I've told you that we have, for example, um, yeah, two different footprints, more like a little bit wider. The other one is a little bit longer. Um, we checked that these, um, that our demands or sorry, our requirements would fit more or less in both footprints. But we give also to the manufacturers um, additional space depending on the footprint we have, so that they can, for example, enlarge their building or that they can also put, for example, the outer coolers in other direction or, for example, the um, auxiliary transformers also in another, another position. This, those kind of yeah, freedom we have to give in this, um, in this tender. And um, yeah, as you see, it's it's a little bit difficult because it's not that you um, this kind of framework agreement that we're tendering right now. So it's not that you can, for example, have, um, yeah, tender a circuit breaker, and you will buy then 80 circuit breakers with completely same design. Here for Statcom, you have really for each for each location you have different um, you have different uh, requirements. For example, noise, you have the footprint. Uh, geotechnical um, requirements and also for the um, yeah and also harmonic requirements. So those kind of things we have to consider for each for each location. But anyhow, our goal or let's say our approach is to um, to tender this with a framework agreement. And this this was for us in the last year a really big task because it's not so usual to to uh, tender a frame to make a framework agreement for this kind of yeah complex system. But let's say um, in one year we have we are, as this kind of tender um, is, should be finished, and yeah, let's see if we have let's say uh, have found two, um, two or three suppliers who can, yeah, construct or erect and commission those kind of statcoms for us. But this is let's say um, the phase one, and in this phase one, I think this is the most important information because you heard a lot of things about grid forming so far, and this. In this tender, grid forming behavior is not explicit. It's not. It's not really demanded. As let's say, we give the option to include this, and we would give a better evaluation for that. But it is absolutely not demanded because we don't want to exclude manufacturers um, which are not able to do it at this stage. But this is phase one. And uh, can you go maybe for uh, the next slide? Here, for example, I also want to show you for phase one. Um, Let's say our standard building, which we want to uh, erect together with the manufacturers. So that's the reason why we, in the beginning, so before the tender, we the reason why we created those kind of buildings because uh, with our experiences with HVDC statcoms, we um, we have seen that different manufacturers have different civil uh, civil um, suppliers and also uh, different civil um, erection companies. And we saw a lot of quality issues with that. So that's the reason why we put so many efforts right now into our civil design. So that um, we have, let's say, a similar design for each stat common. So let's say for TSO for us is quite important. So it's like um, to, to speak about that. So next slide. Roman, we're running tight on time. If you could uh, try to get through yeah. those last couple of slides, appreciate it. Okay, okay, I will do. So um, to summarize now um, the next the next phases. I hear I made here I made um, um, let's say uh, a little explanation about how the, usually the statcom is working and yeah, to to keep it short, a normal statcom um, will will create a voltage as a voltage source source which is uh, synchronized to the grid voltage, and what a statcom usually is doing on the let's say on the secondary side of the transformer when they're creating this kind of voltage, they will change the amplitude. This is everything what a normal statcom is usually doing in a steady state operation. So if we go back to the next, if we go to the next slide, um, but as my colleague said, we have also um, a future demand for active power, and in general, a statcom cannot supply this kind of active power. It's, it's usually not not possible. Maybe they have some uh, yeah, energy stored in their submodule capacitance, but um, large energy is not stored for that to provide active power or to let's say to cons consume active power. And as you see it here, also with the, uh, with the phaser diagrams, um, those kind of active power supply or let's say cons uh, consumption will only happen when you have a voltage angle jump, as you see it here in the formula we have we have shown to you. This is also usually used for the HVDC, let's say uh, for the HVDC control. And 
as you see, when you have, for example, when you have this kind of voltage angle jumps, this is the thing what you need for, for good form of control, you will need active power. And this active power we need, for this active power in general, we'll need uh, short-term storage. So we can go to the next slide. And for that, um, we facing some problems because no supply so far can provide uh, a statcom really with energy storage systems. Let's say there's one who can provide it on the paper, but there's no pilot project so far imp um, yeah, implemented in, in, on the TSO level. So, and even there are also some other, let's say, questions that we have, for example, where to where to locate um, this kind of yeah, battery or supercapacitor in the topology of a statcom. So there are several questions for that. And uh, we spoke already with manufacturers, and if you go further, um, they have provided to us several, let's say, topologies, how we can do it. And I can tell you there are several topologies and it's not fixed. So it's also for them um, um, a big question how to specify this in the, our next tender. But so far we are, let's say, we have, a, we have a good connection with the manufacturers. We have also right now a study with the um, University of Ilmenau, who are also doing some research for us. And until the next year, or the, un until the end of this year, we want to specify um, a, a, even a topology, a preferred topology for a statcom with energy storage system. And yes, here we say we, we have we have a, a lot of questions which we have to figure out until the end of this year. For example, which kind of topology? Where are the bottlenecks for a, let's say for this kind of supercapacitors? Because we know there are limits um, with regards to the operational voltage, so we cannot um, raise this as high as possible. This has also an impact on the um, yeah, on the reactive power capacity or the active power capacity of of the statcom itself. Even what is the maturity of this kind of supercapacitors or yeah, battery systems that, that could happen? So there are several questions also for the operation charging and discharging. And this is um, the thing we um, yeah we together with other TSOs with manufacturers and also with um, one university we want to figure this out until the end of the year and. I can say so because we signed several NDAs. I think we are on a good path, and everybody is aligned that we um, want to achieve this goal end of the year. And so maybe end of the year you will know more about how to implement a statcom with energy storage system. So next slide and last slide. Maybe Cornelius, you can uh, find maybe the last words because I think it's your 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 slide. Yes, sure, Roman. So just really quickly, we've learned that we uh, have several problems arising in the future, like transient stability will be uh, a challenge, load flow changes will be a challenge. We have a high penetration of power electronic interface generation and frequency stability, last but not least, will also be a challenge. And to tackle all these challenges, we need standardized grid forming statcoms with short-term short storage. and as you remember my first slide, this will only fill the gap of what is not provided from renewable energy sources and um, and consumers. So in total, we need those uh, two to really work together in order to fulfill our goals for the energy transition. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm really looking forward for your questions. Thank you, we, we ran a little bit Late, but I think that the presentation was was very very interesting to our audience. We learned a lot of information, and I'm going to run over just a few minutes. I think everybody has other obligations, myself included. But I think there's so many questions, good questions. I'd like to get in a couple of them before we have to sign off. Um, one of them, uh, Cornelius here, you said that there were some weird voltage dips even without faults. Can you say more about what these are and why they're happening? Yeah, probably, um, Florian, that would be a question for your system operation. Department. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Already unmuted myself. So actually, these um, these uh, voltage shifts that we are facing were um, especially um, fast changes in active power, like uh, power plants um, running running off, going off, switching off, um, like um, or I think a classical thing is. Uh, early in the morning, um, wind power plants are um, started activated and starting to be activated, or like a, like a let's call it wind front. 
is uh, is going over um, the region. So actually, it's, yeah, um, fast changes and rapid changes in active power, and this just shows and uh, and represents how sensitive the grid became towards these um, power flow changes regarding voltage sensitivity. Okay. Uh, one I skipped over, but I'll, I'll go back to, I think a large part of the answer was given in the last few slides, but our state of the art grid forming inverters and the scale of operating a transmission grid without synchronous generation units. Mm. Who would like to take that one? I think it's for me. Yeah. Our state of the art grid forming inverters and the scale. So it means, so I think the question is, if they are already in place, I think I give the answer. So yeah. good forming yeah, inverters in place are or available. They're, they're not state of the art. As I, as I told you, we do a lot of research and also um, that's the reason why we spoke with the manufacturers two years ago. And we know that they put a lot of budget in their R and D to develop these kind of grid forming converters. And we let's say I have to we have said a lot of NDAs, so that's I can, that's the reason why I cannot say too much. But I can tell you um, in a few months, weeks, years, um, these kind of um, inverters will be state of the art. Okay. I know they're available in smaller sizes, but I haven't seen anything that size. Yeah, and yet. smaller sizes they are, but um, it's yeah. like for, for, let's say, for the, for the big ones who are usually supplying the TSOs, this was not state of the art so far. Right. And also on the, on the transmission area, there are also some other, we're facing some yeah, special yeah. problems. Okay, here's one on synchronous condensers. Are there any conventional power plant generators that are going to be converted to synchronous condensers to help gain reactive power and reactive power capability? Yeah, we have seen this conversion in Germany a few times already. The experience was not too good so far because it's a lot of maintenance costs and a lot of operational costs that will add up. And especially on the cooling. Yeah, and synchronous condensers, after all don't have the perfect um, grid behavior like grid forming um, inverters would have. So we, we take this uh, option to uh, convert the conventional power plant generators to synchronous, conden uh, to synchronous condensers as a last resort if we can't um, fill this gap within the next uh, few years with Statcom. Okay, I'm gonna move to the uh... Question from Nick Miller, are the wind and PV plants providing voltage support? Do they have closed loop voltage regulation? And do you send them voltage set point instructions? Yes, maybe I can take this one as well. So we have um, directly connected uh, wind parks that actually have um, uh, that provide a voltage support for our grid. But unfortunately, this was only included in the uh, connection network codes a few years ago. So the majority of um, PV and wind plants for the moment are still not supporting the voltage in a way you would want it. Okay. Um, a couple of questions on the, the two hertz per second rock off limit. How is it established? And could you explain in more detail the rock off metrics indicative of grid separation likelihood, how they were determined? And yeah, maybe I can start with the two hertz per second rock off. Um, so there are two approaches. One would come from the system defense plan and taking um, under frequency load shedding um, methods that would need uh, some time to be activated. And by just taking this time and the frequency where it will be activated, uh, you would want the first uh, um, step already be in place before activating the second step of the under frequency load um, shedding in order for the system defense plan to work. The other one is that um, the two hertz per second is just the mean uh, rock off for the whole um, island that you will see. And within this island, every node will have a slightly different rock off. So you might actually see some rock off that might be at seven or eight hertz per second, and you still want generation plants to be stable there. And this is why we can't get uh, much higher than the two hertz per second. Okay, I'm going to ask a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. So many good questions here, really, really a lot. Uh, Hazim, would it be possible to share your requirements of grid forming inverters from manufacturers? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. 
<laughs> Not yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe once they are, they are published, um, because you know we are preparing them for the for the tender, and uh, they are just we cannot figure out. Yeah, I understand. But there are a lot of German. There are a lot of uh, publications done by the German TSOs for the yes. recruit forming. Okay, behaviors. maybe we can send out a reference with the uh, answers to the questions that yeah. don't get answered. Uh, for example, we have, we have a good code, and especially there we have this FNN paper where we really define how to, let's say, evaluate this kind of good forming behavior. Cornelius, you're right. You're right. Okay, that would be appreciated. A uh, question from Shahil. Are statcoms configured to provide short term fault currents higher than their continuous rating? It's the idea about it. Yes, correct. As it's during, for example, during this short term, um, yeah, yeah, voltage jumps or voltage angle jumps, we would see, um, let's say, the provided current will be higher than the usual, let's say, uh, quasi stationary um, yeah, voltage support. It's much okay. higher. All right. And the last question from Eckerd Kutman How far do you require or incentivize your connected DSOs to support you with reactive power? depending on your TSO needs. Maybe this is a question that I could get. Um, so it's because it's an interesting field. We are working on it right now to get them more included into this thing. Um, because as you saw, like uh, um, the generation potentials are changing from the transmission transmission level to the, to the distribution level. So of course there are new uh, potentials growing and there are new potentials to be gathered and to be used. So we are working on some, some operational concepts to, to better harness these potentials. And uh, these sources are going to be a part and an aspect of future grid planning as well. OK, um, I think we're going to need to cut it off now. We're a little, little beyond our allotted time, but this has really been great. I um, really want to thank you for a very informative and educational presentation. I know I learned a lot of new things today, and I think everyone else did as well. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted, and we'll get the answers to your unanswered questions posted as quickly as possible. We appreciate your engagement, and we'd like to invite you to our ESIG monthly webinar next Wednesday with Neil McDowell, a professor at Imperial College in London, on the topic of extracting flexibility from industrial resources. This will be held next Wednesday, July 21 at 2 p.m. Eastern. All are welcome. Further information on all the webinars and upcoming workshops can be found on our website at esig.energy under events, and you're all invited to attend. Information on all the GPST webinars can also be found at globalpst.org. Florian, Cornelius, Roman, I want to thank you again for this very timely and insightful webinar, and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. In the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.